Father, thank you, Lord, today for your word. And uh, there are many messages to be heard in this message today. I pray that uh, there be something for each one of our hearts today, Lord, that we'd find encouragement uh, to continue on, to keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, for you're faithful to us. And I pray, Father, you would meet every need here today. Just bind the enemy, Lord. Help our eyes to be tuned in to what you would say to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get in today, I want to ask you the question. We would all very much appreciate it if God would let us know exactly what his plans are, wouldn't we? If I could get up and tell you, okay, this is what God is wanting, and when we do this, this is what's going to happen. We don't have that promise, though, do we? And for us, as in a personal sense, we don't have that from the Lord either. If we only knew a little further in advance what was coming, it would help us a lot in our planning. But that's not generally how God works. So I want to read before I can get into the message today a little bit of a story about a man named Philip from the book of Acts in chapter 8. And kind of give you an idea of what God did in this man's life. And this is more often the case of how God is going to work in your life and in my life and in our life as a church, too. From Acts chapter 8, it says that an angel of the Lord spoke to this man, Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And we make note that it says, This is desert. So he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and take and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth in his humiliation. His justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Is it of himself or of someone other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, well, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, well, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water and he baptized him. Now, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So here you have a picture of Philip being in this town. I didn't read all of chapter eight, but he was in Samaria. And here in this area of Samaria, that kind of rhymed in the area of Samaria, Philip was preaching the gospel and a mighty work of God was happening there. People were getting saved right and left. And things were happening in the young church there in Jerusalem. The Ethiopian eunuch uh, somehow knew about baptism, and I believe it was probably when he was there in the town worshiping, he probably saw some baptisms happening there with this new church called these Christians. They were down there being baptized. Because it doesn't say anywhere where Philip actually talked to him about that, but yet when he saw water, he asked about being baptized and Philip encourages him, if he's a believer, to do so. And so he went down and he was baptized. Now, in the middle of this wonderful work of the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip, and all he tells him to do at that moment is go down to Gaza, and it just simply says, it is desert. And so Philip never questions the Holy Spirit's instructions here. That is mind-boggling to me. Why would God send him down to Gaza out in the middle of the desert when this wonderful work is happening here in Samaria? 
And it was when he got to Gaza that he saw this chariot then. And then God speaks to him. He didn't tell him any more. Just go there. So you can picture this man of God. He's down there in the road that leads out of Jerusalem. He's out in the desert. It's hot out here, God. There's people not getting saved back there, God. You don't read any of that. Here Philip comes down there and he's waiting. He waits on the Lord and then the Lord says, the Spirit of God says to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot that's coming by. So the Lord didn't lay the whole thing out to Philip right away. And as we see what's going on in Samaria, we could say that Philip would have had good grounds to go and question God. There's nobody in Gaza. That place is a desert. People are being saved daily in Samaria. There's a tremendous revival going on here. Why would you want me to go down to Gaza? That's a, an appropriate question. Have you ever asked God one of those appropriate questions? Why, God? Why is this happening right now? Why are you doing this to me? What's going on, God? This doesn't make any sense to me. What is happening? And yet Philip is just faithfully doing what he told him to do. And it'd be like Greg Laurie in the middle of the Harvest Crusades. Thousands of people getting for, coming forward and getting saved. And he goes, well, God's called me to go out to El Mirage. I'm just going to go out and... Stand out there on El Mirage Road and, and just wait for something. It's like, are you out of your mind? What would be out there other than a couple of cars racing down the road and trying not to get caught by the highway patrol? And yet, here he goes down. It doesn't seem to make sense. Even though it doesn't, Philip takes that first step. And when the Ethiopian's chariot comes by, the Holy Spirit gives him that next step of what he's to do. And he leads this man of prestige and power to the Lord. And thus, God leads his people step by step, we see here. Now, this Ethiopian eunuch was a man of great power. Ethiopia is in the, the, on the continent of Africa. And so this man takes this newfound faith, a man who is leaping with joy, a man who is excited about the Lord, and he goes into this continent taking the word of God with him. And a lot of people believe that he spread the gospel and that the gospel of Jesus Christ was spread through the continent of Africa through this Ethiopian eunuch. That's what God had planned. Now, I don't know if that's what took place where the whole nation, the whole continent, rather, uh, would have heard about it through him. But he was certainly a man who God wanted to use and a man who was more than willing to be used of God. And so it is that God does things that doesn't make sense to you and I in the very beginning, but it makes every bit of sense in the end. God has got a plan. God knows what he's doing and he works that plan. Now, let's see how Abraham did when his trust and his faith in the Lord is tested. Verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in this land. The land of Canaan is very much like desert parts of California where we live. It's a wonderful land. has a pretty decent climate most of the time. I may have a difficult time convincing you of that today. But dependent upon rainfall. And we've lived in times here in the last few years where there have been drought conditions. I remember in areas of California where they were told to not water their lawns so much and not do laundry so often and not wash your cars and that they were actually in some communities going and giving tickets and warnings at least when people over water and there's water going down the drain. There are times in desert places when there's no rain and we experience this drought. Well, Egypt is more impervious to drought and famine because it's more dependent upon uh, the, the river Nile overflowing with the water banks rather than on annual rainfall. And this makes Egypt then kind of a natural destination for people who are suffering through drought times. So Abraham, here being a man who has herds and has flocks and has all these servants and all of these possessions, he's here in the middle of this famine and it just makes sense to him. I'm going to start losing some of my animals here if I don't do something quick. So without any hesitation, he takes off and he heads down and goes into Egypt. Can God take care of Abram and his promised before he even entered this land? Is God capable of taking care of my problems and your problems? 
If we belong to the Lord, he promises that he's going to do that. But like Abraham, I think we sometimes question the Lord and his ability. Now, before we even judge Abraham here, we've got to take into consideration he's had several horrific things happen. First of all, as we mentioned before, his wife was barren. Now, to a man at this time, that was a horrific problem because it was a disgrace to not be able to bear children to the woman and a disgrace to the man to not have a descendant to pass on your belongings to. Number two, his father had just died. And if any of you have had a loved one die, you know how difficult that is to bounce back from that. Number three, he had journeyed into this promised land that God had given him. And here in this land are a nation of people called the Canaanites. Now, they were idolatrous enemies of God. And we're going to read a lot about the Canaanites as we read further in through Genesis here. And now Abraham has to deal not just with all of those things, but now a famine. What's he going to do? So the challenge of these circumstances were just too great for him. He buckles under. And so he took counsel not from God, but from his fears. And he pushes the panic button. And the result of Abraham, as we're going to see here, is a disastrous excursion into Egypt during which he ends up compromising his testimony. He ends up compromising his marriage. And he ends up compromising his own integrity. And so we've all experienced these kind of circumstances. You're living in the full joy of fellowship with the Lord and then suddenly something happens in your life and it just seems to pull the rug right up underneath your feet. So if this has happened to you today, I just want to encourage you to take a look at how uh, the end result is here for Abraham. Once a man asked a Christian friend how he was doing and his friend responded, well, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. And the man responded to him and said, well, what are you doing under your circumstances? As Christians, we shouldn't be under our circumstances, but we should be above them. Circumstances are not coincidences. They're not things that happen to us that God is not aware of, that he's not control over any more than the circumstances that Abraham was under in this condition. But rather than being above his circumstances, he allowed himself to be under them. And I think many of us today can relate to that. And so God or God is going to convey to Abraham. And I hope to you and I today that you never, never, never have to be under circumstances. God, who had called him, was controlling these things in his life. And I believe this is a test of Abraham's faith. And he flunked the test. Just like I have flunked a lot of tests that I have taken. God has put me through and I haven't done well. Warren Wiersbe says a faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. And that's true. If your faith can't hold up to the test, then it's not going to be much of a faith, is it? But God's purpose in using trials in the believer's life is not only to verify our faith, but to purify us. To remove the drouse that's in your life. You say, what's drouse? Well, when they would purify gold, they would put it under extreme heat. Gold and silver. And in this heat, the impurities of the gold and the silver would rise to the surface. And then they would take somewhat of kind of a skimmer and they would skim off the drouse. These impurities constantly purifying the gold. So you can see the parallel here in our life. God turns and allows the heat to be turned up underneath you and I as Christians. And the impurities are the first thing that rise to the surface. The example of that would be you're driving down the road. You're in a hurry to get to the doctor's office. And all of a sudden you have a flat tire. What immediately comes out of you in the preceding minutes shows the impurities of who you are. Because oftentimes we're not pleasant to be around, are we? I have experienced that often in my life. And my wife tries to encourage me, of which I don't hear much of what she has to say. The things that you say with your mouth that precede these times of testing 
shows you the impurities that are in you as a person. And so God will bring these things to the surface, not to just show you how much you have grown, but to show you how much there's still dross inside of each one of us. God will allow these things to happen. God knows what kind of faith we have. But you know what? You and I don't. We think we've overcome a certain area of our life and then something happens and all of a sudden this outburst comes out of you. And we wonder, where did that come from? Oh, it was there. And God knew it and God allowed this to happen to show you that it's still there. Oh, that old guy, he, he's still alive and well. And the only way to take advantage of this is to get into the school of faith and be willing to take the examinations to go with it. I hate exams. And I certainly hate exams of any kind, especially those that God gives us in the time of testing. And so the famine was a test of faith. God is saying to Abraham, I've led you into this land. I'm able to sustain you in this land. Can you trust me to take care of you here? And Abraham said no. Paul, writing to the church of Galatia, he says, hey, you Galatians, you've started well. What has hindered you? They started off walking with the Lord, but then there were these false teachers that came in after Paul and they begin to preach all of this stuff about, well, yeah, what Paul is saying about salvation, that it's through Jesus Christ, that's true. But you also need to observe some certain laws. You need to keep the Sabbath. It's, it's Christ and keeping the Sabbath. It's Christ and abstaining from certain foods. It's Christ and you must be circumcised. It's those things combined with all that. And today we have churches that still teach that. Salvation is not just through Christ. It's Christ plus baptism. It's Christ plus observance of certain days of Sabbath. It's Christ plus abstaining from foods. And Paul says, what, what's going on here? You started off so well and now you're letting these things come in and interrupt your life as a Christian. We need to ask ourselves that. It's the case of a lot of people today. You get a good start, but then suddenly something happens. And then what are you going to do? Psalm 37 wasn't written at the time, but it would have been a perfect thing, a perfect psalm for Abraham. Psalm 37, verse 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. That would have been a wonderful scripture. For Abraham. Verse 16 says, A little that a righteous man has is better than all of the riches of the many wicked. And verse 19 it says, They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. I have found in my own life that I have gone through times of famine, and God has been faithful to me. Now I look back and I see what God has done. But at the time, He doesn't give me all of those things. I want God to give me more, and He doesn't do that. And it came to pass when He was close to entering Egypt that He said to His wife Sarah, Indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Now there's some tactful things for a man to say to his wife. Hey, man, you're a babe. A wife likes to hear that from her husband. But it was a ploy. He didn't do it because it was simply a fact. But there was some alternative motive in it. Then he says, therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they're going to say, this is his wife. I'm dog ugly and you're beautiful and they're going to like you and they're going to want to know why am I with you? And so he says, and they're going to say that they're going to come and kill me, but they're going to let you live. So we're kind of struck at the beginning here of Abram's concern over his 60-year-old wife's attractiveness. Now, you might think, well, 60 years old? Well, remember, at this time, Abraham lived to be 175 years old, and Sarah lived to be 127. So this is midlife for her. So it would be more like a woman today of 30 years old. So at 60, she was still a very, very beautiful woman. And the custom in those times was to negotiate some kind of a dowry with a father or a dowry with a brother. And that would be you would have to kind of pay to have her. And so dad would make off with some donkeys and some horses and maybe some cattle. Wasn't that a nice thing for you women to think about? It's going to cost my dad a couple of cows for me today, you know. 
But that was the custom of the time. They had to pay a dowry. And if the Egyptians saw that Abraham was Sarah's husband, he reasoned that they might murder him to have her so they wouldn't have to pay this dowry. Oh, the thoughts that we begin to think when we're out of God's will. Some of the things that we have connived and come up with when we're not walking with God. David Guzik, uh, who is a Calvary Chapel author, he tells of a Jewish legend regarding this event. The way the legend goes, it says that when Abraham went into Egypt, he tried to hide Sarah in a casket. And when Egyptian customs officials asked what he had in the casket, he said, I have barley. And they said, no, I don't think so. What if that casket contains wheat? And he says, all right, well, I'll pay them the custom of whatever it costs to have wheat. And they thought, huh, that was too willing. Well, what if it has pepper? Well, then I'll pay the cost of, of whatever it costs for pepper. And they thought, well, this is interesting. He's just going along with us way too easily. Well, what if it has gold? Well, then I'll, I'll go ahead and pay whatever it costs for the weight of this casket and gold. And he said, whoa. Well, what if it has precious stones? Well, I'll go ahead and pay for that, too. Well, with that, they said, something's going on here. And they went ahead and opened the casket and they saw the beauty of Sarah and said that all of Egypt shined with the beauty of Sarah. And then they said that all other women compared to Sarah looked like monkeys. She was even more beautiful than Eve herself. Now, I don't buy into much of these legends, but it's one of the things they considered about Abraham and his beautiful wife. Verse 13 says, Please say that you're my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So now you can see where his attention really was. He's covering his own backside. He wasn't so concerned about her. He's concerned about himself. Isn't that what life is about in the flesh? It's about self. It's all about what is it in it for me? And here was where Abraham had gone. Now, this was, in fact, a half truth. So we're going to read when we get to chapter 20 of, in verse 12. We'll see that Sarah was, in fact, a half sister of Abram. And so this is a half truth. I used to tell my kids when they would lie to me and they'd say, I'm not lying. I'd say, OK, you're not lying. You're just telling me an untruth. It's not quite a lie. It's just not the whole truth. Well, a half lie is a whole truth is a, a half lie is really a, a, a full lie. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. It's not telling the truth. Abram's intent here was clearly to deceive and he trusted in his plan of deception to protect him rather than trusting in the Lord. The further you turn away from the Lord's will, the more you get into these kind of programs of trusting your own ability and your deceptive ways rather than the Lord. If you want to do something wrong, you can always find a good reason to do it, can't you? And if you can't, then Satan is right there always to offer up a few suggestions. And it amazes me how quick... Christians even are to telling these little white lies. You tell enough white lies and you'll get colorblind. Did you know that? You'll begin to tell more and more lies and you'll have to build lie upon lie to cover the lie. It's better just to tell the truth. And I've even heard a few around here. Not quite the whole lie, but just a little bit of one. And we think that's going to be okay with God. I think you should really think about what you're doing if you're going to call yourself a Christian and lie without even a hesitation. And so it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians did see the woman and she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Well, Abraham here didn't take into account that Sarah might catch the eye of Pharaoh himself. He wasn't planning on that. He had his plot figured out, but he didn't take into account that Pharaoh might figure into the equation. So there would be no lengthy negotiations for Pharaoh taking her. He had the power to take her and he had the ability to pro produce any compensation or dowry that would, might be needed. And so the Pharaoh made his move quickly. He just took her. And all of a sudden, here's Sarah found 
in the harem of the Pharaoh, the, the top knot guy. And he treated Abraham well for her sake. He gave him sheep and oxen and male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and he gave him camels. And so here, Abraham is being blessed in such a financial sense. And yet, here his wife is now being taken from him. This is not a good place for him to be. God blessed Abraham when he, even when he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Isn't that amazing? How many times you've wondered, why does God allow that person to remain as that boss? Or why does that God allow that person to remain as a pastor when he's doing these horrible, vicious things? Why does this go on? Where's the justice here? Well, the same where the justice is in your life and mine. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give you justice? And he's not going to give it to them either, even though they very much deserve it. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my own wife now. Therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go your way. Get out of here. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. But wait a minute, the the famine's not over yet. Well, you're out of here, man. You lied to Pharaoh. Sadly, a pagan king had to rebuke this guy. Oh, it's a bummer, man, when the world rebukes you because you're not walking with the Lord the way you should. The actions of this king shows that Abraham, if he would have trusted in God and he would have just told the truth, everything would have been all right. But he feared his own fears. It's amazing that this unbelieving Pharaoh acts better than the believing man of faith here, isn't it? Salvation, listen carefully. Salvation, though it is not a matter of comparison, it is a matter of conversion. Because you have been converted, not because you're being compared to another brother or sister in the body, God blesses you. That's what salvation is all about right there. Isn't that incredible to know? That I don't have to, you don't have to live up to some other brother or sister in the body of Christ. It'd be a horrible thing for God to say, well, you're a pastor now, Mike, so I'm holding you up next to a mirror of Billy Graham. If you don't lead as many people to the Lord as him and you can't preach as as well as he can. Or the Chuck Smiths or the Greg Glories or John Corsons. If you don't preach as well as they, then you're not going to get any rewards from me at all. But God doesn't do that to us people. <clears throat> Simply because salvation, God blesses us. And because Abraham was a man of God and he was faithless. That didn't change the fact that God was faithful. Aren't you glad? Abraham avoided the famine and came out of Egypt far wealthier than he'd gone in. But his excursion into Egypt was very costly. He did lose a bit of his testimony there, wouldn't you say? I don't know how his marriage stayed together. If this would have happened in your life and my life right now, men... We would be happy to get Larry H. Parker because we'd be in some serious trouble. My wife wouldn't have put up with that. And his integrity was ruined. But God brought Abraham to a great understanding of his faithfulness when he lacked that faith. We have an opportunity as Christians to grow from our mistakes. To use these occasions as a stepping stone to grow closer to the Lord. To see how faithful God is when we fail. You could describe this episode in Abraham's life by quoting 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. There it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So that's why God blesses people who don't deserve it. As we enter into chapter 13, Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him to the south. 
<clears throat> Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. That's so important to see. Even though Abraham had completely failed, he went back to the place where he knew God would be. Even though Abraham came back from Egypt with all these riches, he returned to the same place he was before. Right back where he started. He was more confident in his ability to lie than in the protection of God. But I want you to hear this. Listen carefully. When we read in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, we come to Abraham and this is what is said of him. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Wait a minute. What about this part about him going down into Egypt? Are you reading that anywhere in there? The failures of Abraham are never listed here in the Hall of Faith. The message for you and I, if you earnestly are seeking and struggling with your soul and who might be being condemned by the enemy for your failure or for your weaknesses. For that person that's being beaten down by the accusations of the enemy, it's a word of encouragement that God is faithful and He will prove Himself faithful even to you. God will bless you not because you deserve it. He will bless you not because you've been perfect, but He will bless you because He is gracious. He will bless you because He is loving and because he is a compassionate God. And to that we say, yeah, Lord, bring it on. Don't we need these things from the Lord today? The blessings of God are the result of grace and not a reward because of your goodness, of what you've done. Now, when God finally writes the records about you and me, he's going to write only about the triumphs of our faith. Isn't that incredible to know? Right now, you probably have a real list of history of failures that you have kept in the back of your mind. And it doesn't take much for the enemy to bring those failures up to you. And it beats you down. There are people who are not even serving in the church today because they feel so unworthy. And yet be encouraged by this testimony and the story of Abraham that in his failures, God never lists them. But in the hall of faith, he lists all of his accomplishments. God is going to do that for you and I, too. Isn't that wonderful to know? Those things will never be brought back up. Christians, we receive God's grace so willingly. But we sometimes don't dish it out so willingly. We know that we have been wronged. We stomp our foot and say, I, I'm, I'm standing up for my rights. And yet, it's the Lord who denied all of His rights and went to the cross and told us that we are to pick up our cross and follow Him. There's a story in the book of Philippians that Paul refers to. There were two women there. Their names are Euodius and Syntyche. Some people have changed their names to Odius and Suntechi, I think, is what it is. And they're arguing with one another over something in the church. And Paul steps in and says, you know what? Settle this issue. In the first Christian church of the first century, a lot of the non-believers were interested in the things, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because the church had this incredible love and forgiveness for one another. They were blown away by that. There's this fellowship that was going on amongst the believers. And every man wants to be accepted and loved. And so they were drawn to that because it was so incredible. And I believe the church has lost a lot of its power today because we don't have that going on. 
Now, we have some natural things working against us here in our own fellowship. We don't have a a facility where we could have a lot of midweek studies and we can get together a whole lot. But one thing I want you to pray about and, and ask the Lord to do in your life is to give you a love for the brethren. To have that kind of a attitude towards those around you, not just in our church, but those that are in the Christian church, it might go down the street to one of these other Christian churches that we would love them as brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's so sad when you hear that some and so is not a Christian because they were never baptized the way we baptize and things aren't done the way we do these things. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And the world is watching us as a body of Christ. And how we respond to these things are going to be a witness to that world out there. What makes us different from them? And you know what? The only one that I can approach that on is myself. The only one you can approach that on is yourself. God changed my heart and give me a love. Now, this doesn't mean we don't deal with sin in the church. We have to. Then we would be in sin if we didn't. Any more than as a parent, we let our children get away with things because we just don't want to deal with it. No, you need to deal with it. And to not deal with it, God will deal with you. But we deal with it and we do it in love. And when that person does repent, we welcome them back in love with perimeters. And we've had to do that here in our body. We've had to deal with sin in the body. And we do reach out in love. And yet people judge. They want to throw the first stone. To dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. It was written by Ray Stedman. And there's so much truth in that. Oh, we're going to have a glorious time in heaven, aren't we? Well, God's saying, I want you to work with one another in unity right now. Well, that's a little different story. I don't want to do that. Do it anyway. What about my rights? What about your rights? Christ set aside his rights. Are you saying you're not going to set aside yours? Well, that hurts. It hurts my pride. Do it anyway. For the glory of God and for the unity in the body of Christ. So he returns back to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. That's where we all need to come back to, isn't it? When a Christian has fallen, oftentimes the last place he wants to go is to the church. Because we're known for shooting our wounded. This is where they should come. Now again, that doesn't mean we just let someone come in and say, oh, well, you sinned and that's okay. I heard recently about a girl on a worship team at a church that got pregnant. And the pastor encouraged her to hurry up and get married so she could stay on the worship team. Because they didn't want to lose her off the worship team. Well, that's... Wrong. You need to deal with those things when someone has fallen, but do it in love. And we need to deal with them and show them and teach them how to come back and how to repent and, and how to be accepted back in the church. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. He comes back to the house of God and there he meets God again. And we continue in the book of Genesis. We're going to see Jacob having an encounter with the Lord at Bethel. And then later on, he leaves that area and God calls him back once again to the place of Bethel. A lot of times there is real benefit to be found and a blessing in returning to that first place where we met God. Some of us need to do that today. Maybe you have weaknesses. Maybe you have failed. Maybe you could relate to Abraham today. Well, the encouragement is then come back to Bethel. Come back and meet God where you first met Him. He hasn't moved. He hasn't changed. You have. And so come back. Abraham comes back to Bethel. Instead of torturing himself about his past sin, Abraham got busy doing what he needed to do. Living with a tent as a pilgrim and with the altar as a worshiper and calling on the name of the Lord. What great encouragement that brings to us today. Are you living with a tent as a pilgrim? We mentioned it before. We get so settled here in this earth. We need to pull up our tent stakes. Be ready to move at any time. Because this is not your home. 
we need to be ready and prepared to go home. So don't get too settled here. And I've mentioned it before. Just own your possessions. Don't let them own you. And second of all, we are to be a person, a worshiper who has an altar in their heart. Is there an altar that's burning in your heart for Christ? A place where you can go and meet Him? Some of us have lost that altar. We don't know where it is anymore. We feel distant from the Lord. We're instructed in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. There the Lord is speaking to the churches. And He's speaking to the church of Ephesus. And He says there to the church of Ephesus, Look, you guys have done really well. You've been a good church. He says, you've withstood against the enemy. You fought the good fight. So we could say, yeah, that's us. But here's the warning. He says, but I have one thing against you. You forgot and you left your first love. And so he instructs them to do three things. He tells them, remember from whence you have fallen. He tells them to repent. And he tells them to go back to doing those first works. Here's how it reads. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So God is desiring from us. Remember. You remember when you first accepted the Lord? How things were exciting? Remember the story we just read about the Ethiopian eunuch here? How he went on his way and he was happy, he was joyous. Well, the enemy knows how to rob us of that joy, doesn't he? Remember, remember those times when God would speak to you and you would hear him. Remember those times. And he simply says, all right, and here's what you're to do. Repent. Repent means in turn and go the other way. So if you've been walking on your own and you've been kind of far away from the Lord, repent. Come back to the altar. The house of God. And then it says, do the first works. You know what to do. This Ethiopian eunuch, when he got saved, he began to proclaim. I imagine that caravan heard the word of God the rest of the way back to Ethiopia. He was excited about the things of the Lord. And I imagine he had quite an effect on everybody he had influence over. Do you have an effect on people around you? Do you have any influence in their life? To show them the joy of the Lord? Or are you under the circumstances? Rise above them today. God is using these things in your life to test you. To cause you to grow in your strength and your reliability on Him, not on yourself. 